and welcome to the South African Astronomical Observatory. My name is Ted Williams. I am the director of the observatory. Today we will announce an unprecedented astronomical event of great significance, and uh, also one in which South African astronomers and South African facilities have played an important role. There are press conferences like this one going on at this minute all around the world. More than 3,500 astronomers coming from over 300 universities, observatories, and scientific uh, institutes uh, have, across the world have contributed to the research that we are about to present here. And there is a coordinated release of scientific papers in international journals uh, at this time. In this press conference, we will highlight the uh, contributions of South African astronomers, uh, some of whom are here to explain the events to us. This work has been supported by the Department of Science and Technology, the National Research Foundation, and the Southern uh, African Telescope, Large Telescope Foundation. 130 million years ago, in a distant galaxy, two incredibly dense objects, known as neutron stars, merged together in a cataclysmic explosion called a kilonova. This event was so violent that it distorted the very fabric of space and time. The effects of that explosion, traveling at the speed of light, reached the Earth on August 16th of this year and were detected by the LIGO and Virgo gravitational wave observatories. Subsequent observations by SALT and other telescopes in Sutherland have played a seminal role in understanding that event. For the first time, we have been able to identify and study the source of the gravitational wave event. Dr. Daniel Punema, uh, SAO uh, postdoctoral researcher, Dr. Petri Weissenen, the head of SALT astronomy, and Dr. Stephen Potter, the head of SAO astronomy, will now provide more details about the event and the South African contributions. After that, we'll introduce all of the astronomers who, from South Africa who played a role in this uh, investigation and take your questions. Daniel, over to you. Thank you, Ted. This spectacular event was produced by the collision and merger of two neutron stars. These extremely small and dense objects are the remains of giant stars that have exploded as supernova, and more mass than the sun is compressed into a sphere that is about the size of a city. These neutron stars are commonly found in pairs, and Einstein's general relativity predicts that these incredibly massive objects should produce detectable gravitational waves when they merge. Gravitational waves have previously been detected four times by the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO, leading to the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics just a few weeks ago. However, this is the first merging neutron star pair rather than a pair of merging black holes. It is also the first time that the source of the event has been precisely localized and identified allowing subsequent observation across the electromagnetic spectrum, including gamma ray, X-ray, optical, infrared, and radio measurements. This multi-messenger observation is unique and unprecedented, and SAO and SALT have played an important role in these follow-up observations in order to identify and classify this object. I will now hand over to Dr. Petri Weisman, who will discuss SALT's follow-up campaign. Thank you, Daniel. So um, I'll tell a little bit what happened that day at SALT. So um, this was several weeks ago in August, and there was a day of kind of intense flurry of activity. There were emails, messages coming everywhere. Pick up your phone, read your messages, read this uh, throughout the day. This was just a few hours after the gravitational wave passed the Earth, you know, like that, that event, which uh, you can ask a little bit more about later. Um, a telescope in Chile then finally was able to localize 
the, um, the event seen in the optical just to the outskirts of a galaxy that Ted mentioned, 130 million light years away, NGC 4993. And when I got those coordinates, so I just happened to be observing at SALT at the time, we got those coordinates in the afternoon, decided to drop everything uh, because we knew that everybody who had a working telescope in the southern hemisphere was scrambling to get data on this. So we dropped everything else, went for it, as did several other telescopes in, in Sutherland, SAL. And uh, we managed to get a spectrum. It was a top observation we had to observe in the twilight before it actually got dark. As some, many of you know, SALT doesn't point all the way down to the horizon, so we had just that limited amount of time available. Since I know that Sutherland is, busy, is, is listening at the moment through streaming, I should thank you guys because there was something which happened that afternoon. They had planned a technical intervention in the, in the evening. They had done something already. I had to call them at 4 p.m. said, please reverse it, put everything back. And they had to redo everything so that we were ready for the observation. We did it. And the eventual result is that SALT was one of the very first observatories who get to get a spectrum out of this. So we'll talk about a little bit later now uh, what exactly it showed and how it's how it, um, changed. Because the, the crucial aspect over here was to get on it early and to then keep observing. The, the science comes out from combining the data from throughout the, the event over the hours and days. And uh, just to finish off, the, for me, the, the significance, I think, is illustrated well. If, if you consider that we've been looking at the universe essentially through one sense only. We've been looking at it, seeing it, right? Light. So we do multi-wavelength astronomy. We do optical, infrared, radio, all of that, with meerkats and all. Uh, but it's still one sense. So now this gravitational event a couple of years ago, uh, it, it, you can think of that you all of a sudden started hearing voices from somewhere in the universe, right? We don't know where, from. And now all of a sudden, for the first time, you could localize it to one, one object. For the first time, you know, I, I could see Simon over there speaking and putting that information together, the two senses together, that's the immensity of this, this, this event, really. It, it promises so much more in, in observing the universe and understanding the universe. Now, for a little bit more detail of what's hap what actually happened then on SAO as a whole and what other telescopes did, I'll hand over to Dr. Stephen Potter. Thanks, Patrick. So, it's my privilege to actually show you uh, the observations that were taken. Um, so, I'm going to put an emphasis on the South African partic participation in this international event, but in the context of everything that went around, happened around the planet. Um, so, as, as Daniel said, this event uh, came from two orbiting neutron stars. Now, these neutron stars were probably orbiting each other for millions of years. And, and it was only in the last few minutes of their orbit before they finally spiraled it into each other was there a massive release of gravitational radiation, almost a tsunami of gravitational waves. Uh, but this was 130 million light years away. So by the time these gravitational waves arrived here at Earth, there are only minute ripples in space and time. So that's why uh, they had, we had to build these uh, very uh, accurate detectors to detect these minute variations in the space-time continuum. And so after the merger, um, you, know, you can see this is the, the actual LIGO data showing the merger. Then after the merger, theory predicts um, that there would be a massive release of uh, high energy particles and radiation. And um, there are two satellites in space called Integral and Fermi, made by the Europeans and the Americans. And indeed, two seconds after the merger, there was a gamma ray burst of radiation confirming this part of the theory. And then pretty much simultaneously, theory predicts that there will be a massive release of um, optical light as well, so visible light, the sort of light that we can see. And this here is one of the first images that was uh, made of this event. So this, uh, this broader region is the dwarf galaxy, dwarf galaxy uh, that was imaged. It's 130 million light years away, so it's not a particularly high resolution image. And that spot there is the, uh, the explosion from the merger neutron stars. 
So this telescope was made by the Lis Compass telescopes. This is a network of telescopes all over the world, and we host some of these in Sutherland. Um, further detailed observations were followed up by the Southern African Large Telescope. And indeed, we were, we were one of the first telescopes to take an early spectrum of this event. And this is a crucial time in taking a spectrum because this confirms, this helps to confirm that this was indeed a kilonova explosion. And then together with further observations from other observatories across the world, we could see how the brightness and color of this explosion uh, evolved over time. So the salt spectrum showed that it was a, started off as a particularly bright blue explosion, and then days later it faded and turned red. Um, so then several days later, theory then predicts that uh, as the optical light fades away, there will be a brightening in the infrared wavelength. So remember, infrared light is, uh, is light that we can't see with our eyes, but it's the light that our TV remote controls use. Uh, we have a set of telescopes in Sutherland that are uh, especially built to detect infrared light from the universe. And as predicted by theory, a few days after the event, once the optical light had faded, there was indeed an infrared uh, counterpart to this explosion. So all these observations, they were only successful because of the timing and availability of our telescopes in Sutherland. To be there one day after the explosion and to continue monitoring this event for days and maybe weeks to come. Theory goes on to predict that this explosion will possibly brighten at radio wavelengths as well. So our Meerkat radio telescopes based here in South Africa will hopefully uh, continue to monitor this event uh, for weeks to come. So that's the main results, and I'll come back to Ted. Thank you all. Uh, I'd like to now introduce uh, some of the other scientists who were involved in uh, the work here in South Africa and ask them to come forward. Uh, Dr. Fernando Camilo, the Meerkat Chief Scientist. Uh, Kai Stats, a visiting scientist from the LIGO Observatory. Uh, and SAO astronomers uh, who were involved, who participated in the observations. Dr. Incarni uh, romero Comonero, Dr. David Buckley, Dr. Stephen Crawford, and uh, Dr. Sudanji Barwood. Uh, so the experts are all here, and we'll be happy to take your questions. Watch yourself. I had a roll the <laughs> Any questions? If not, we'll ask you questions, so you better ask them. <laughs> Um, I understand the ellipse or uh, the location of this event will likely be quite a large area on the side. How does it look like? Who wants to take that one? Uh, we have a. I can take it. I do have, actually have. We do actually have the image there. If we can click through to it. Um, so the the uh, detection was detected by uh, LIGO and both LIGO detectors in the U.S. as well as the Virgo detector in Italy simultaneously, um, with a very slight delay, actually. So the uh, Virgo detected it first, and then the two LIGO a couple of milliseconds apart. From that, we already had uh, a, a swath of the sky, which was a possibility. But uh, unprompted by the LIGO detection, the Fermi uh, gamma ray detector in space detected a gamma ray burst, which was then also detected by the integral space uh, uh, telescope. And combining these five observations actually narrowed down the patch of sky to a very small area, um, as you can see there, with about 50 uh, known galaxies in it. Um, and from that, the, the, the Swope telescope actually managed to locate one with the new transient uh, quite quickly. David, do you want to comment about yeah. uh, some of the... So, so some of the um, wide field optical survey telescopes in the world uh, played an important part in localizing what the optical counterpart was on the basis of knowing the positions that we were flying from from the high energy gamma rays. Um, 
it was also known from the nature of the uh, of the gravitational wave event that it had to be relatively close, in other words, less than the distance of this galaxy or about that, not, not much further than that. So that really localizes the number of potential galaxies in the field and quite fortuitously there is a program going on surveying galaxies at those particular distances. So there was already some a priori information on the galaxy that in the end this um, event happened in. Um, so by the combination of these uh, various facilities around the world, it was finally localized to this particular galaxy that was mentioned. Uh, and then, of course, the discovery right in the outskirts of the galaxy of the optical out outburst just led to all of the other follow-up observations that were done. All of these hundreds of telescopes and astronomers. Fernando. Well, I'm just going to say maybe a few more details that I don't think have been mentioned yet that are very interesting in this event. So first of all, to address your question, that area of the, the green, the dark green circle is about 30 square degrees or so, so about 60 times the area of the moon, but well, uh, 100 times, let's say, the area of the moon on the sky, give or take. Uh, and there are indeed many galaxies there, but LIGO, the LIGO event, of course, also gives you very interestingly the distance, of the, the distance of the source. Uh, and in that case, well, not surprisingly now, the distance that we know for the galaxy independently, from what it means, matches the, the LIGO distance. So it all hangs together about 130 million light years away. One thing that I think hasn't been mentioned yet is that this is actually a, a very nearby event as far as these things go. This, this so-called short GRB that, 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 we, that was observed by, by Fermi uh, we've known of those events for many years now, but all of them take place further away in the universe. So this is very interesting that it happened nearby, relatively speaking. So what does that mean? Uh, it remains to be seen in, in detail, uh, but it's quite interesting. So I, I, I think it's super exciting. I mean, some of us have been dreaming about these things for decades, literally. But, and these observations are starting to answer some of the questions that we have, but they're also raising other questions. So it's relatively nearby, which also, by the way, means in some sense it's relatively faint uh, in, in gamma rays. What does that mean? Is it a coincidence? Is this an unusual event? Is this thing still where we detect many more like them in the years to come? Uh, what is, how do we compare these events that this is nearby to any more that we've seen until now just in electromagnetic waves? Much further away in the universe, yeah, everyone's can see this enormous wealth of data from this event. Elias. Uh, one of the optical magnitude of the surface of another question was the system detected before in the X ray. Petri, you could probably answer that. Uh, well, the, so we detected it. Just about exactly one day after the gravitational wave event, about 11, 12 hours after the first localization of it, it was 17 and a half magnitudes in uh, GNR bands. That, and then it quickly faded in the blue, got redder. Uh, X-ray, who remembers when the first X-rays were you can detect it. Put you in the two seconds. Uh, gamma ray was very quick. Yeah. Not that we know. No. Nope. Uh, there are optical images that show the same galaxy 20 days before the outburst. There's, There's no nothing there. there. Yeah. The other note is that the, the short gamma ray burst did not have any uh, gamma ray afterglow. Uh, and that puts constraints on the viewing angle of this object. So we know that we're looking at uh, within about 30 degrees of the axis of rotation of this uh, curliest neutron star. We're not looking right down, otherwise we would have seen the uh, indications of, uh, of beams radiation we can get when you look down a jet of a, of a gamma ray burst. And we're not looking at John because the, the optical data shows that it's a very blue object characteristic with a, an outflow that's coming away from the, uh, the plane of the of the system. So it's sort of halfway in between. We're not looking straight down and we're not looking at John. 
And you can see here that, that image I've mentioned. Nothing there 20 days before the event, and then the optical source. 10 hours after the event. And for those of you who are not astronomers, that number that Petri quoted of 17th magnitude is about 25,000 times fainter than you can see with your naked eye. Eric. It's a merged object now. How do you know that you were going to it before? So, uh, I'll you. so uh, we, ha we actually have uh, the gravitational waves provide very good constraints. And we actually have uh, from those gravitational waves, which were visible, detectable um, by the LIGO instruments for almost 100 seconds. Um, that's a lot more than the gravitational waves that have been generated by the, the black hole mergers previously, um, by some, by, by almost an order of magnitude. Um, and because of that, watching that in spiral, we actually have measurements of the, the masses of these two neutron stars orbiting before they've merged. Um, about 1.1 and about 1.8 times the mass of the sun, respectively. I had a remote question from the southern staff. Um, I think based on the success of this observation with the LIGO instruments, is there any likelihood of more being built? Is there a science case for building more instruments, possibly in southern? <laughs> you mean gravitational waves? Yes, <laughs> there is, in fact, a plan to build one in India now. Um, so, in a few years' time, there will be three operating gravitational wave observatories. So, they're going to relocate one of them from the US to India. And so, there'll be US uh, Virgo, which is the one in Italy, and eventually India. And that will give a sort of much better ability to localize where the gravitational waves come from. But to be fair, I don't think it's federal. <laughs> Not in <some. laughs> If I can add to that just for a moment. Um, in Japan, there's uh, Kagra. Kagra is very close to being finished, and that's a cryogenic um, gravitational wave detector. So to operate at a different frequency, but also contribute to the overall um, by the, or the, in, the, uh, the gravitational wave detector observatories worldwide. So eventually, we'll have four. And there's now research and planning, hopefully, but the funding will be very difficult to build much, much larger uh, observatories. So these are four kilometers, and they're now looking at doing 40 kilometer arms. And if successful, that would give us a very different view of the gravitational wave universe uh, because the, the sensitivity would be at a different frequency range. One interesting detail with regarding the Indian one, Indian LIGO instrument. Uh, is that it's being operated, or it will be operated by Ayuka in, uh, in Pune in India, who is one of the salt partners who we very much have a lot of intera interactions with all the time. And if the minister happens to be listening, this might be a good idea. <laughs> Get rid of some of that stir change. Okay. Uh, no. Does anybody know why? Well, no, no, no neutrinos that I'm aware of. No. But uh, another thing that I think hasn't been mentioned yet here, which is extremely interesting for this event, is the kilonova aspect of, of the optical uh, and infrared and, and ultraviolet event. So uh, many of you will know, and some of the others may know, that most of the massive elements in the universe are formed inside stars, inside massive stars, and they convert lighter elements into heavier elements and so on. And then many of those massive elements, uh, carbon, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, up to iron and, and other elements, get dispersed through the interstellar medium uh, during supernova explosions when really massive stars blow up. And eventually those heavy elements go on to form other solar systems and planets and our bodies and so on. But uh, so that, that's all good and we've known about this for decades and it all kind of works. But, but in detail, there are always questions about what, where certain elements are actually formed. For instance, just to take a shiny example, gold. Uh, our models of nuclear synthesis and so on and stellar evolution don't necessarily explain very well the observed abundance of, of an element like gold in the universe. One question is, well, where did all this gold come from? 
and then some some suggestions were there what, that in events like this, there were until now hypothesized and theorized that during the collision of very neutron rich uh, materials, namely two neutron stars, that some of these elements would be formed. And so that was a beautiful theory and wonderful, but it had not been observed before. And it turns out, in, in detailed spectra of this event, that this has now been seen. So some of that optical light there that people have detected is actually due to the decay, the radioactive decay of some of these elements uh, being produced in this enormous energetic event. So this is a beautiful thing. That and other similar stories that we'll just keep on giving for, for years to come. This event has only begun to be explored, so we'll tell us about the project. Sarah. I might have missed this, but what's next? Is it a big neutron star? It's a big neutron star. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, inclination of this thing is not based on and it's not echo. It's about 30 degrees. Yes, so, how is it that you see a GRB if you're not looking right up there? Well, if you don't see a GRB afterglow, but you see the fireball in the initial. I mean, the gamma rays themselves, though, aren't they supposed to be strongly beamed and you only see it when it's going right at you? Well, I think for the, the short gamma ray bursts, um, this is consistent with. The observations by integral that you're not looking right down the jet. I don't think Maybe it does, I don't know. Right. So the solid spectrum showed absorption. Not not really. Uh, we took a low, re low resolution spectrum, spectrum uh, to get the overall shape which changed fast. As we mentioned, it was very blue. The next day it was redder already. Um, but the figure, do we have it over there? Yeah, so it, we don't actually trust the, the, the wiggles all the way in the left, so not astronomers, in the left side of that uh, spectrum. It's probably due to background subtraction issues because we took it in twilight. So we trust the shape is, is, is correct and that's ch changing, but um, like Fernando was mentioning, other people have seen gold there, lead, all of those exciting things for the first time seeing elements being formed in an explosion like that. We didn't get that. That's from Chilean telescopes who were able to observe it for much longer integration times. A little bit later as well. Late. Late. So they didn't get it as fast, but they got, as we say, higher signal to noise spectrum a little bit later on. If I, can, I, can I add a layperson's perspective? Yes. I, th I think something that's really um, exciting for me as, as someone who's coming into the sciences just recently is that we all ask the question, where are we from? Where do we come from? It's something we've been trying to answer for a long time. And it's very literally the case that this type of explosion, this type of merger and event created the very elements that makes up our body, as Fernando said. So we are stardust in, in, in a poetic way. And I think that's a really beautiful confirmation that's happened, that's come out of this event is that we're now seeing for the first time direct observations of the formation of the very elements that make up our bodies, our planets, and everything that we take for granted around us that's not hydrogen or helium. So just a, just a non-scientific <laughs> encapsulation. If I can add, uh, add one comment to this, uh, follow up. So some of you may be wondering whether this sort of thing happens just far away in the universe. I mean, 130 million light years away, and we said it's relatively close, cosmologically speaking, but it's still kind of far away. And the, the answer is no, it happens in our galaxy as well. I mean, we know of double neutron stars. We have, we have, uh, seen for about 50 years, we've been discovering pulsars in our own galaxies, which are neutron stars. And we found a handful that are, in fact, these binary neutron stars. And we can tell that they will collide with each other in the future. Their orbits are shrinking. We measure the shrinkage of their orbits. Very small shrinkage currently. But to give you an example, the one, if I recall correctly, that's going to collapse soonest will collapse in about 40 million years. For the one that we know. So we know a system in our galaxy that 40 million years from now will presumably cause something like this. And humans or other beings in our galaxy, when that happens, are going to have quite, quite an interesting day. If I might add to that, the, the models for the evolution of these uh, systems predict that for the so relatively nearby galaxies within 20 megaparsecs, there should be one a year 
one of these events a year, roughly. Moses. Are there plans to improve the speed and the ability of initiatives within the structure of the structure? Right. So, so for the for the follow-up part, it we it's actually the, the timing is actually great in the sense that we're we're thinking of um, putting focus on on uh, SAO science, and we've agreed already with the whole community and with the staff over here that time domain astronomy is, is a big thing that we do well, and we should be doing even better. So, indeed, we are thinking about uh, saying having much more rapid, more automated. Uh, triggering systems, you know, a telescope sees something and rather than hoping that somebody is not having coffee at the time or having a chat with their colleague, an automated system picks it up and sends it to another telescope which sends it to other telescopes depending on what exactly you want to do. So the system of using the whole Sutherland Observatory, all the telescopes, one or two dozen telescopes over there, uh, chunks of the time we have and the many that we own ourselves to have that uh, work as a kind of giant machine for this kind of science, it's indeed in our plans. I might add that there is a, a telescope at Sutherland that participated in the attempts to find the counterpart to the very first detected gravitational wave back in 2015 and surveyed a very large area of sky at the time. And that was a binary black hole merger, not two neutron stars, and it's known from theory that they should not produce any optical or any radiation, and indeed no one found anything. There was a similar very large campaign back then, uh, which was uh, had participation from SAO, but uh, nothing was found. So this is two years later, and I think it's quite remarkable state that we're in now that we found within two years of the first detections of gravitational waves, the counterpart. If you take uh, the analogy of gamma ray bursts, which have been known for 30 years before they ever found an actual object uh, that was associated with a gamma ray burst in the same way that we have found here. Maybe I'll, I'll just add a quick thing before we end, just on the note on that sort of ironic thing in this whole event. Three weeks before I was sitting at the telescope looking at that first combined light gravitational wave event. I had been in a meeting where we were discussing science for the future of, of SAL, and there were strong arguments saying that it'll be decades before we'll see anything on the sky to localize it close enough that there's worth, it's, it's worth spending observing time of our telescope doing it. It's not worth putting any effort into it, it'll be decades. Three weeks later, literally three weeks later, I'm sitting at the telescope, Looking at this thing, it's it's remarkable. Thank you, Samit. Uh, good point. So I just want to make a comment on the radio waves. Uh, we haven't mentioned Nearcat, a little image of Nearcat Leon, and so uh, Nearcat, this very sensitive radio telescope being built in South Africa in the Northern Cape. Uh, we looked at it. Uh, we looked at this event three times over the past few weeks, and we didn't detect a radio source. A radio source has now been detected, uh, for instance, with a very large array, the James the Very Large Array uh, Telescope in New Mexico. It, it's a very faint source. Um, and in fact, now we know that our Meerkat upper limits, as we say, are within about a factor of two of the actual flux of this radio source. Meerkat's being built, I mean, if this event had happened exactly as it was a year from now, Meerkat easily detected and we will have other opportunities starting is it next year late next year there's the next LIGO campaign and so on uh, but but it's interesting to contrast for instance what happens in the optical versus what's expected to happen in the radio and x-ray so first the, the radio source is expected theoretically to brighten as time goes on for a few weeks to up to maybe a few months whereas the optical source by and large is dimming so so the, we, we and other colleagues around the world continue to monitor the source in, in radio waves, and, and, and we'll see what happens. And that tells us something different about the, the certain uh, binary uh, medium and about the energetics of the event and the direction of the jets and the debris of the explosion with the certain uh, stellar material. So, so yeah, this is an event that keeps on giving and will do so for months to come, observationally. I mean. 
there'll be hundreds of papers written on this. There are hundreds of papers almost published today, and it's just remarkable. There were actually seven papers that came out of uh, these observations at SAO. Right, so now in ones, but, papers yeah. either in press or, or submitted. Yeah. Last question by Ramatul. Yeah. Infrared detections were there yeah. detection in the infrared. It was, it was uh, indeed, as Petri mentioned earlier, that uh, uh, once the, the optical light has been fitted, it goes bright enough uh, in the infrared. And I was happened to be at a telescope and, uh, and uh, we followed up in the uh, infrared with the IRSF telescope. Yeah, so that's, one that's, yeah. So that's the three color uh, J, H, and K band combined. In uh, infrared image from my RSF. You can see there are a lot of things on the screen. You can see that. Kind of if you look at this picture on the, your computer screen, you will clearly see the source. So I'd like to thank you all for coming out this afternoon uh, very much, braving the rainstorm. Uh, and I hope you caught a sense of the excitement of this event, that it's the first time that this combined multi-messenger astronomy has ever been done. Electromagnetic radiation across the spectrum and gravitational radiation. It's clear we stand at the threshold of a new day in astronomy. And we will be stepping across that threshold, especially some of the younger people in the audience. Dr. Kaistat has a LIGO uh, video that will start playing now. Uh, there are refreshments outside. If the people in the back haven't eaten at all already. <laughs> and uh, the sinus will be available uh, if members of the press have other questions. Thank you.